Do you have a suggestion for a Rockstar Impact Podcast guest? Go to impactpodcast.com and just click Be a Guest to recommend someone today. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by ERI. ERI has a mission to protect people, the planet, and your privacy and is the largest fully integrated IT and electronics asset disposition provider and cybersecurity-focused hardware destruction company in the United States and maybe even the world. For more information on how ERI can help your business properly dispose of outdated electronic hardware devices, please visit eridirect.com. This episode of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Closed Loop Partners. Closed Loop Partners is a leading circular economy investor in the United States with an extensive network of Fortune 500 corporate investors, family offices, institutional investors, industry experts, and impact partners. Closed Loop's platform spans the arc of capital from venture capital to private equity, bridging gaps, and fostering synergies to scale the circular economy. To find Closed Loop Partners, please go to www.closedlooppartners.com. Welcome to another edition of the Impact Podcast. I'm John Shigarian, and I'm so honored to have with me today my good and longtime friend, Leo Raudis. He's the president and CEO of Call to Recycle. Welcome, Leo, back to the Impact Podcast. John, good to see you again. It's always great to see you, Leo. And we've had a lot of fun over the years working on a lot of important issues. But today we're going to be talking about the great brand that you're the CEO and president of Call to Recycle. But before we do that, I want to share with our listeners a little bit about your fascinating and important background, because some of the listeners and viewers haven't seen or heard you discuss this before. Um, talk a little bit about your sort of legendary and storied career in the environment, environmental protection space, and where you started and how you ended up here at Call to Recycle. Yeah, it's it's been a, it's a pretty long and winding road, as you know. I mean, I grew up in Chicago. Uh, my, my parents were uh, World War II war refugees, actually. So they, they settled in Chicago, or met first, and they settled in Chicago. And um, uh, I grew up in the city, but always uh, had a love of the natural world. Um, and we would regularly get out of the city, like once or twice a year, up to northern Wisconsin, northern Minnesota, just to you know be out in nature. And I was just really just taken by it. It just really formed uh, my worldview. Uh, what I was interested in. So that led me to you know, pursue a career in, or I would say an educational career in biology and ecology. So went to University of Illinois, Chicago, studied biology and psychology, got a graduate degree in ecology at the University of Minnesota. And I always thought I was going to be one of these guys who's working out in the field, uh, collecting samples, forestry, things like that. And uh, just by uh, just total randomness, I ended up in the environmental protection field, which is really more populated by uh, engineers and more of the hard scientists. Um, and uh, so I worked as a state regulator for many years, and then moved into the private sector where you and I met, uh, working in electronics recycling and, uh, and climate change issues at Best Buy. Um, did that for a number of years, uh, moved on to uh, do some other things in between then and now, taught at the University of Minnesota for a bit. Uh, but yeah, I've been I've been sort of in the sustainability realm ever since I left government uh, back in the around the late early two thousands, and um, came out to Seattle, which is where I live now. I've been here about five years. Uh, I worked for Microsoft for a few years. That's what brought me out here, and uh, now I'm at Call to Recycle, which is what I've been doing for the last few years. It's been it's pretty been a pretty interesting ride. Never would have sure. predicted it. Yeah, <laughs> but is. Do you feel that the the background you had, both in the public side and the, and and the private sector, that give you a great balance of information and inform you to 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 then be the CEO and the and the president of Call to Recycle now? Oh, very much so, because you know we're we're a nonprofit and we really do operate in that space between the for profit private sector and the public sector government. So being able to understand both of those worlds how people talk, what they're interested in, understanding stakeholder perspectives. Uh, it's super, super valuable. But you know, even, even at my time in Microsoft, uh, where I worked in the data center and cloud division, 
you know, we would uh, work a lot with communities who are interested in understanding what the company was trying to do in terms of citing data centers. And, you know, I felt for me personally, just having uh, some experience in, in working with stakeholders and communities, understanding how passionate people can be, um, it's it's been pretty key. So I, I feel pretty, pretty blessed to have had a, a diverse set of experiences that I lean on all the time. Uh, and for sure, it's it's helpful in my current job. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you've been the president and CEO of Call to Recycle the last couple of years. And for our listeners and viewers who want to find you and your great colleagues at Call to Recycle and all the important work you're doing there, please go to call the number two, recycle.org, call to recycle.org. What, what, talk a little bit about some of what lessons learned and the battery recycling landscape that you now see since you've joined Call to Recycle and uh, what, you know, looking backwards a little bit, a couple of your favorite wins and uh, and accomplishments uh, since starting that great and new position. Yeah, uh, we've had a lot going on in the last few years. So maybe what I'll do is just, just give a brief overview of who we are. It might, might help people understand uh, just, you know, what we do and why we're here. So we, uh, we actually, this year is our 30th anniversary. So we've been around since 1994 and we were formed by uh, a group of battery companies that um, most of which are with us still to this day on our board and as, as uh, key partners. But they formed us basically to, to, to responsibly manage batteries at end of life. Back then, it was mostly nickel cadmium batteries. Uh, we evolved along at the time. So most of what we collect now is lithium ion batteries and increasingly single use alkaline batteries. But we're a nonprofit organization. And uh, we, we basically were here to uh, set up and run uh, battery collection networks across the country. So we've got over, I think, last count, 18,000 collection sites across the United States. And uh, we, you know, last year we collected 8 million pounds of batteries. Uh, but it's been, it's pretty, pretty interesting. As far as the last few years, what's been notable is just the, uh, the absolute explosion of categories uh, in batteries. So for, for most of our time, you know, we collect this, you know, small batteries, the, Doubles, triple ACs, uh, button batteries, things like that. And that's still a core part of what we do. But in the last few years, we moved into uh, e-bikes, uh, outdoor power equipment, uh, EVs, uh, to some degree, grid storage batteries. You know, on the inside, they're all the same. Um, but they're but the challenges in terms of how to actually get those things out of market and properly recycled are quite different from there. Um, is, is the uh, also not only has there been an explosion of new products or products that historically have been gas powered or uh, powered otherwise are now using batteries, uh, but then also you have the convergence of the, no pun intended, the explosion of uh, battery fires at the same yeah. time. And, you know, talk a little bit about managing that um, ongoing ecosystem and expanding your business at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So, so on the first part, you know, on the conversion of gas powered equipment, that's that's been a pretty big driver of change for us. So, actually, the last month, we launched a new program with six manufacturers that make outdoor power equipment. So, you know, it's the Sam Black and Decker, Toro, uh, et cetera, uh, companies in the world that are making batteries. You know, they're like sort of uni big. We'll sit on the back of, of a lawnmower or power a gas uh, or what used to be a gas powered leaf blower. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we're, de we're definitely moving into these these bigger batteries because of the conversion away from gasoline power equipment. Uh, the, the the emergency and the fire issues can be pretty profound. I mean, it, it really drives most of the investment that we do uh, in our day-to-day -day work. So if you think about what it takes to collect a battery safely and transport it, from a collection site, like say if it's a Home Depot or a Lowe's or a Best Buy or a community center. So, you know, we provide them with all the equipment to be able to, you know, gather those things up. We train folks to, to handle them properly. And then you've got to get it shipped off to a uh, sorter and then recycle them. So that's all, there's a whole lot of steps that go into that. There's a lot of regulation that um, federal government in particular uh, pays quite a lot of attention to for very good reasons, because you don't want to have a fire in your recycling facility or on a truck. Uh, things like that. 
But the same things that you have to do uh, to move those batteries that are just purely end of life, you know, in other words, they're fine, the condition is good, they're just out of juice. Um, the, the regulations that apply to those uh, also apply to uh, the batteries you have to move after an incident, say if there's a fire or if there's a recall or something like that, but sort of times 10. Uh, so, you know, you've got to run the basics, but then once you, you know, you're at the point of dealing with a damaged battery, the risks are a lot higher and more profound. Um, so we, you know, it's interesting. I mean, since we've been doing this for three decades, all the things that we've learned along the way about how to manage all these little tiny batteries everywhere in thousands of collection locations, you apply the same lessons to, to managing the bigger, you know, sort of riskier stuff. Um, and that's, yeah, so it's been, we've been seeing quite a lot of work, quite a lot of interest. Uh, people reach out to us for help to do this because this is what we do. Now, talk a little bit about the um, the, uh, the 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 growth of battery recycling vis-a-vis -vis legislation. Has the legislation um, uh, has the velocity of the legis new legislation that outlaws batteries from landfills and and puts uh, some guardrails around how batteries can be handled? Uh, what you expected, or has it actually uh, has is 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 it is the velocity increased more than you were you were even thinking of? Yeah, it's the latter. So I mean, you and I met back in the day when when e waste regulations were just starting to hit uh, everybody's yeah. radar. It's it's it, it's a very very similar phenomenon. Wow. Um, so when I joined Call the Recycle in 2021, we started to see some activity at the state level, but. Uh, I would say in the last year and a half, it's been accelerating dramatically. So even faster than what we saw in the waste. And the reason for that is uh, concern about fires. So, you know, we have waste haulers, waste management companies, uh, people who are running the waste handling facilities. You know, they're, they're seeing fires and batteries, so they want to make sure that they do everything they can to keep those out of the, the waste stream, out of the traditional recycling waste stream. Uh, so yeah, it's 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 going pretty fast um, and broad. So we ant I anticipate that within the next couple of years, we're going to have uh, just a substantial number of states that have new laws on the books. What's, and what's interesting about it is, so these laws typically do two things. One is they put the responsibility on the manufacturer of the battery, putting it in the market. They put, they put the responsibility onto them to set up programs to collect and recycle the batteries. Uh, but to be able to do that in a way that meets their public policy goals, it, it, they, they require quite a bit more than that. So yeah, you have to let them know what percentage of the battery that you're collecting are being recycled. Uh, how are you reaching out to communities to let them know that there are collection sites out there and how to properly dispose? Why should they recycle batteries? How do you make sure that uh, you know, communities, uh, rural communities, uh, places of very little population also have access to recycling options and not just in the big cities and towns. Um, and, you know, so they, they care quite a bit about that. So there's sort of the, the things that the policymakers are are interested in are pretty consistent, but they're, you know, they're, they're, they're difficult to do. And the other thing that's interesting, um, which you and I have talked about a bit, is uh, the you know, states, policymakers, regulators have come around to have a pretty different view on what should be recycled. So for years, we would focus on rechargeable batteries. That's what we started doing. Um, and uh, and there was this, for a long time, there was this belief that single-use batteries, alkaline batteries, things that you know people typically put in a TV remote or something like that, just really didn't have a lot of uh, recyclable value, or there really wasn't a really compelling reason to do it. Uh, there was a lot of information out there about the environmental benefits, et cetera. That thinking has really changed. And, and I think it's changed for a couple of different reasons. One is the recyclability of these single-use batteries is pretty high. So we see numbers like in the mid to upper 90% range of uh, uh, what you can actually get out of these batteries back into commerce. So uh, things like carbon, zinc, manganese, um, just the you know basic steel that goes in the scrap metal. Um, it's pretty pretty high recovery rate. So I think there's just people come around to sort of different different mindset in terms of whether it's worth it to keep these things out of landfill. I think generally now people are agreeing that yes, you should keep them out of the landfill. And and, and let's, let's let's stop there for a second. Yeah. So, so I mean, no battery, rechargeable, lithium ion, alkaline should be going to a landfill, a river, or a lake, or anywhere like that. Really shouldn't. I mean, we always encourage people to recycle all batteries, and we don't have the ability to do that everywhere, but that's increasing. 
Um, you know, you and I have been working on this project with Staples to do that in their stores, and it's just been just amazing to watch them pull that together. Um, and what they're do what they're doing is is basically in, al in alignment with what the policymakers have really come to understand, which is like you need to get all the batteries back. Right. The other interesting thing, and I think uh, this is why the Staples work um, is really interesting, is it really drives home the point that consumer confusion uh, and ease of recycling is absolutely critical to making sure you do this right. And what historically we have had a challenge with is when you tell people, okay, you can recycle this battery, but you can't recycle that battery, or that one needs to go there versus that one needs to go there. The first uh, instinct for most people is like, you know what, I'm just going to leave it in my drawer and I'll figure it out next day. Right. And so it creates a lot of friction in the system. What we see in uh, the state of Vermont, which a few years ago required, uh, we put into uh, place some regulations uh, on single use batteries, not, re not rechargeable, just single use batteries. We actually saw a strong uptick and continue to see a strong uptick, not only in the single use, but also rechargeables. And to us, that's pretty clear evidence that. You just have to let them, you got to give people options to recycle all of them, and um, so that's a, that's a pretty big change that we're seeing in the market. That's so interesting. interesting. I mean, yeah. but it's also so if the if the if the macro premise is none of these batteries should be going to a landfill, river, lake, or anywhere inappropriate, they should all be being collected by responsible collection agencies like yours, and you are the biggest in the United States and North America by far. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And they, they should be going to a responsible recycler who can get what a high 90s, 96 to 98 percent of the materials out of them and back into the circular economy. Right. Right. Which is, I mean, that that's a that's a prospect that everyone should you know understand and, and really adhere to. I mean, it makes total sense. People shouldn't be sneaking this stuff into their garbage cans anymore. There's no need to anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And in the city where I live in Seattle, I mean, they've actually prohibited those from going into the into the waste stream, which has been a you know a good first step, and the state of Washington, as I'm sure you know, uh, passed a law last year to require battery recycling. That's going to that's going to start happening, in, I think, in about eighteen months or so. Um, so yeah, it's all these are all very very positive trends. It, it literally has all happened in the last year year and a half. Um, Leo, what do you what, you know out of the first couple of years of you being the CEO and the and the president of Call to Recycle? What's one or two things that you're most proud of that that's happened during those first two years? Um, you know, it's funny. It's it's probably not going to be what you think. But to me, it's just the amazing people uh, that we've been able to keep and bring into the organization. We um, so we've we've hired a number of people in the last two, two years in particular, just as our programs have grown. And uh, it's just it, it's just an amazing team that does inspiring things every single day. So, and I knew they were great people to begin with because I've worked with Call to Recycle in the past, but I had no idea. And right. um, and and on top of this, people have been with us historically for years. We're just we're just we're attracting incredible talent, uh, really enthusiastic, um, uh, just great great people, super highly capable. So that to me, that's been the, that's the that's been the best piece. Um, and continues to be an absolute joy. In fact, we're going to have an all-staff meeting here in, in another week. Everybody's going to be traveling from across the country. I can't wait to meet everybody. It's going to be fantastic. That's wonderful. Uh, for our listeners and viewers who just joined us, we've got Leo Rodiz with us today. He's the president and CEO of Call to Recycle. To find Leo and all his colleagues and all the important work they're doing in responsibly recycling batteries and collecting them across the United States and Canada, please go to call to, it's a number two, recycle.org, call to recycle.org. Leo, um, what's coming up in the next couple of years? I mean, lots more legislation, more collection points. You, you, uh, it's. It, I don't think a, a month goes by, maybe even two weeks, where I don't see you announcing another, um, you know, partnership in Canada. I see numerous partnerships announced in the United States. Well, you know, what projects or initiatives that are coming up that you're most excited about in 2024 and 2025? Yeah, well, I've already talked about a few of them. Uh, I think the the one that I haven't really mentioned is electric vehicles. Uh, that yeah. one is uh, that's pretty fascinating to to see that unfold. It's it's a really different animal. I mean, you know, again, inside the battery pack, it's the same stuff that you get in a rechargeable battery in your alarm system. You know, so um, that's so from that perspective, it's no different. But the form factor is just much bigger. Um, the the challenge for both the automakers. The dealers, the used car market, the auction houses, the scrapyards, 
is very, very different. And uh, so we're starting to see some things happening on the policy front. State of New Jersey passed a law. California is looking at doing something. So I think we're going to see some movement toward uh, regulation. But I think more important than that is there's a pretty broad recognition within the industry with the automakers that um, they both have a responsibility to make sure that these batteries, whenever they're at the end of their life, find their way to an appropriate, responsible place. Uh, so there's a responsibility piece, but also there's a pretty strong business imperative. So we, you mentioned partnerships. So we have a new partnership with the Sun Elements, and what we're doing there is we're uh, working with them to move uh, Ford batteries uh, within their their ecosystem. So we're handling all the logistics for um, for these analytics and uh, other batteries that Ford uh, is responsible for. They want these batteries. They, they want the materials, right? So um, so there's I think there's a, a pretty a fundamental shift in the strategic thinking and mindset uh, among folks that is just really driving some pretty interesting innovations. Uh, we saw this coming a couple of years ago. We decided to uh, invest in building out a software platform to, to handle the transport and logistics of these batteries. Because again, it's a very, very different thing from small consumer batteries. So we have, you know, we have a new technology that's essentially a travel agent for batteries. You know, you could, if, if, you're, if you're an end user with a battery, you could book that trip to, you know, a, a recycler or a repurposer, things like that. I think we're going to see more of that type of innovation. Uh, we'll be doing some more. A lot of great, great, great companies out there, startups. I think about a company here in Seattle called Recurrent, which is uh, doing a lot of really good work uh, as it relates to EVs and used car market. Just, just really, really interesting stuff. When you're talking to legislators and 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 other folks on the on the public side, is it that hard now to convince them in a world that really cares about the shift from a linear to circular economy and ESG principles and 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 basically getting the environment on the right side of uh, of being decarbonized? Is it hard now comparatively where we were, you know, when you and I first met? And, and and getting people to climb up the mountain to understand why e-waste should be banned from landfills. How is it to that today, 17, 18 years later in 2024, to convince legislators to do the right thing and ban batteries, all types of batteries from landfills, and then to, to actually legislate them to be handled by responsible parties? You know, it's interesting. It's it's um it's largely a bipartisan issue that everybody agrees on. So it's actually I think the education piece is easier than it was for e-waste. And I think it's because of the profound implications of doing it wrong. So, uh, you know, legislators hear from their constituents, they hear about fires, they want to make sure that people are safe. So I think there's there's a pretty broad consensus. And, uh, you know, generally what we see, we don't, you know, we don't lobby, you know, we're not profit, but we just, we provide technical expertise to the policymakers. Uh, we help them understand how to do this well. Um, it's really about figuring out, you know, what's the best thing to do. I think the, you know, I just mentioned EVs. What's interesting there is I don't, I don't see really a lot of disagreement out there that the batteries need to be handled responsibly and, and come back into commerce and just really that circular mindset. I think the question that people are still trying to figure out is what's the best way to do that. Um, and uh, and since it, that problem is a little bit farther out. Uh, in terms of time, I think people are taking their time to try to get it right, which is a good thing. Um, but yeah, to your, to, your, to your original question, it's it, it's there's there's pretty broad agreement. I think it's it's pretty remarkable. It's happened pretty quickly. Is is really one of the um, the main benefits of call to recycle that that responsible recycling's one of the pillars, if not the the number one pillar of re of good responsible recycling in any category, is convenience. And the beauty of call to recycle is that it literally creates the most convenient way to recycle your batteries, whatever zip code you are in in North America. Yeah, I mean, we try. We can always do better. I think um, I think we've got, you know, as I mentioned, we've got around 18,000 collection sites out there. Um, you know, a lot of the sites, uh, you know, we can't take single-use batteries that so we're building down and up. Uh, that's why the Staples project is just so incredibly impressive and exciting. Um, so I think there's there's a lot of work to be done, but yeah, it, you're absolutely right. It's it's about the it's about the ease and the access. Um, that's really what animates what we do. It's uh, we we don't we don't tend to focus as much on 
uh, the counts collected and the number of sites, and certainly we track all that. What we really care about is accessibility. It's like we're making decisions where to do collection. How do we make sure that we actually we just have enough sort of easily accessible sites for people? Because you got to go farther. You're gonna be... You know, Leo. You know, you you there's there's a, there's one thing that you and I have learned o- over the course of our lifetime. And we're pretty much the same age and same generation. Have had very similar journeys in many ways. Um, is that change is going to happen and it's going to happen faster than we probably ever thought. I was reading the other day about a new battery coming out of China, not saying it's commercially ready yet, but they said they've already started testing it, a nuclear battery that lasts 50 years. What have you heard about that and what other new technologies are coming in batteries that we should be thinking about or be made aware of? Yeah, well, you know, I haven't, I haven't actually dug into that one. I did see that, um, right. and I haven't. Uh, it's very. It sort of provoked a lot of questions for sure. Right. Um, right. But uh, you know, in China, there's there's they're basically going the route of lithium ion phosphate batteries, and it's a different it's a different problem to solve. Um, and I think you know, I I'm just not smart enough to be able to see around all those corners. But it's it just seems like there's always something a little bit better. You know, there's going to be a point at which there's, you're, we're going to reach the limit of how much power you can actually get off of a standard lithium ion battery. And I think um, that's going to drive more change in another direction uh, at some point down the road. And, you know, you get, you get lighter, cheaper batteries that essentially give us what we need, right? So um, it's just, it's remarkable how much innovation is constantly happening in space. I mean, I, like I said, I, I'd seen the note on that one and I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. going to check that out for sure. Me too. Um, I know, I don't, we don't, we don't plan to collect them just so you know. <laughs> gotcha. You know, when it comes to benchmarking, Leo, um, A, you have, you know, I call it the, I, I call the, you know, gr- the, the group of leaders like you who are chief impact officers, chief sustainability officers, or CEOs leading great organizations like yours, one of the coolest fraternities in the world. Talk a little bit about working with your counterparts uh, and colleagues around the world that do similar type of battery collections in different countries and how that works in terms of sharing best practices and inspiring and, and, and inspiring each other and helping each other out. Yeah, it's a it's a big part of uh, what we do in our network. So, you know, we're what's known as a uh, uh, producer responsibility organization or a PRO. People call them all sorts of different kinds of things, but essentially a nonprofit that organizes collection of batteries. You actually you you can find someone like us in a lot of different categories. You have them in e waste, you have them in carpet, paint. Um, uh, we just happen to be batteries. There's a there's a fairly well established um, network of organizations like us in Europe that we interact with quite regularly. They're they're a great source of uh, technical support, uh, knowledge, experience uh, because they've been at this for for a long time. We work very closely with our uh, sister organization in Canada, uh, shares our name called Recycle Canada. They actually used to be part of us, and we spun them out uh, several years back. Um, and then even places as far flung as Australia. So Australia um, has started up a very similar organization. So, you know, a couple of years ago, they reached out to us and they asked us for our advice on how to set up um, their program. So it's a, it's a very, very, it, it feels very similar to the sustainability community that I got to know when I was in the corporate sector in that people are very, very focused and animated by our mission and uh, want to work together to make things work better. It's, it's, it's pretty good. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty fun. You know, so, you know, you are obviously, Leo, a sustainability OG. You've been doing this all of your, most of your career and your adult life. Talk a little bit about uh, outside of your industry, how do you get inspired and, and, and where do you find aspiration in terms of benchmarking with different industries and different brands? Uh, uh, where do you look to for your inspiration outside of the industry that you're in? Yeah, you know, it's uh, and maybe this will surprise you. Maybe it won't. It's uh, it's through what my kids are experiencing in their professional careers as they're sort of getting started. So, uh, I've got a couple of kids. Uh, one is it works in the entertainment industry, and I learned a lot about sort of how that very much more sort of creative driven industry works. Uh, and I get lots of great ideas out of just talking with him. My daughter works in tech. Same thing. You know, I just. I see, when I see sort of the, the, the way a lot of the companies that she works with approach innovation, it gives me ideas. Um, and and then just in my everyday life, I just I like to read a lot. Um, 
I, you know, I'm, I'm very into physical activity and that gives me time to sort of just sort of just sort of get peace and away from things and think about things fresh. Um, so it's any number of things. That's Talking to people like you. Leo, it's, it's always great spending time with you both in person and we're going to be in person together uh, in June and yeah. uh, and, uh, and 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 but uh, also on this show, I thank you always for the time that you spend with us because you inspire me, you inspire everyone who listens and hears you and all the great work you're doing at Call to Recycle to find Leo and his colleagues and all the great work they're doing to collect and responsibly recycle batteries. Please go to call to it's the number two recycle.org call to recycle dot call to recycle.org. Leo Raudis, thank you for your time today. Thank you for your friendship. But more importantly today, thank you and your colleagues at Call to Recycle for making the world a better place. Thanks, John. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Engage. Engage is a digital booking platform revolutionizing the talent booking industry. With thousands of athletes, celebrities, entrepreneurs, and business leaders, Engage is the go-to spot for booking talent, for speeches, custom experiences, live streams, and much more. For more information on Engage or to book talent today, visit letsengage.com. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by ERI. ERI has a mission to protect people, the planet, and your privacy, and is the largest fully integrated IT and electronics asset disposition provider and cybersecurity-focused hardware destruction company in the United States and maybe even the world. For more information on how ERI can help your business properly dispose of outdated electronic hardware devices, please visit eridirect.com.